With the greatest pleasure, Mr. Cross. And let's start right off with our first question, which comes to us from Greenville, South Carolina. Charles F. Kirsch remarks that you are all famous divas on the international grammar circuit, and so he wants to know from you who have experienced it, was the way to the top easy? Did you start with small roles, or did you just burst out of the nowhere into the here, uh, famous from the start? How was it? Miss Arroyo? Well, I sort of burst out of nowhere in a small part. <laughs> a very small part. As a matter of fact, I didn't quite get out because it was the voice from heaven and she's just never seen. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's a start. As I remember, it made quite an impression, that celestial voice. Miss <laughs> <clears throat> Sutherland? Um, well, I started with small roles, too. <laughs> um, I, I did things like... Uh, Clotilda and the high priestess and uh, um, the overseer in Electra. Do you but remember what your very first one was? Oh, the very first one was, was the first lady in the magic flute, but it was quickly followed by Clotilde. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the lady in the magic flute is not an easy <laughs> small role either. It was lots of fun. <laughs> Miss Horn, how about you? Well, uh, a little bit different. I started with big roles in very small places. <laughs> well, the places weren't really small. We make them look small. <laughs> no, no, Martina. <laughs> I can say it. <laughs> well, I heard you in Gelsenkirchen. I don't know whether you'd call that a small place. It didn't seem so small to me, and you were making a big splash, I remember If you that. don't think it's small, ask how many people know where it is. <laughs> Here's another question about your careers. This one's from the uh, Reverend Alfred J. Hubler of Bellevue, Ohio. And he wants to know whether there was any one single event in your development that made you realize that you had an operatic career uh, ahead of you. One thing that told you. Miss Sutherland? Well, um, I was doing secretarial work and trying to study in my spare time. And um, I'd entered for a big competition in Australia and managed to win this, along with a couple of seconds and thirds and fifth prizes on the way up in other things. And um, I'd collected together a reasonable sum of money, so I thought that I might as well take a chance on a trip abroad to see what I could do. So that really was a, a turning point in my career. I felt I was able to give up my secretarial tasks and uh, try. It was, and it says a lot for those competitions. There, there Indeed, really was a great the, deal. Several competitions and then the big, big turning point. I think that's, uh, that's fascinating. Ms. Horn. I would say, since I started singing very, very young, much too young for anybody to begin, actually, uh, as a child, uh, not one particular thing was a turning point which told me that I was going to be an opera singer. I had always more or less aimed for that, even though I hadn't sung any opera because my father, who was more or less... Uh, overseeing my training felt that uh, opera was something one should absolutely not go near until you're about 19 or 20 and then very, very carefully. Uh -huh. So that uh, I suppose the thing that convinced me that I really wanted to go ahead with it was when I had the opportunity to sing Cenerentola of Rossini in 1956. Uh, I, should, I should say that that would, <laughs> yeah, that would really decide anybody. Ms. Arroyo. Well, um, I start, studied to be a school teacher and always wanted to teach school, but so many people and so many events helped make my career that I can't, I'd be afraid almost to point, try to point to one particular one. Mm -hmm. you know, there have been uh, many, think... many glorious ones. <laughs> uh, here's a question uh, from Kino, California. Lila M. Howell asks whether you ever dreamed of singing opera before your poten the potential of your talent was really recognized. And if you dreamt about it, was there one particular role that you uh, saw yourself in, and did you eventually sing that role? Oh, Mr. I did. Royal? It's my dreamt of singing Madame Butterball, Butterfly. <laughs> 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 because, you know, in the early movies, and I was only allowed to see um, what my mother called selected movies, you know, Pinocchio and Snow White. <laughs> Go ahead, laugh now. 
um, <laughs> there were some several times when Un Bel D was the aria that was sung in the various movies, and I remember clearly, <coughs> thoroughly enjoying Butterfly and wanting very much to sing the part, and I'm glad to say it's happened. <laughs> <laughs> we're all glad of that. <laughs> Miss Horn. I don't think that I ever had any dreams about roles which I wanted to sing, but after I started opera, I started having a recurring dream, which I still have. And that is that I arrive on stage to sing a new role, and I don't know it. Oh, we all have that dream. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an awful experience. Well, that's, that's terrifying. It sounds as if you'd had the same dream, Mr. Yes, Reinhold. either that or arrive on stage to go down a flight of steps and you fall. <laughs> or, and you usually dream these things a couple of nights before performance, so you get to that part, and that's the first thing that comes to your mind. You so know? you trip. So I you trip and break yeah. your neck. It's no, no, you just <laughs> trip. <laughs> I dreamed of, of doing Brunhilde, if you please. <laughs> well, I had always heard that you'd made a great start in the direction of Wagnerian roles. Well, I don't that know true? that one could call it a great start in that direction. I, I sang um, Wagnerian um, excerpts in concert, but I never actually sang a complete Wagnerian opera until I did Ava, which was a much different... Uh, to to uh, Brunhilde or Isolde, as I wished, but um, there we are. <laughs> well, I'm sure you can do both of them if you uh, if you felt like it. Uh, mm. Here's David Deutsch of Jamaica, New York, who wants to know what was the best advice that you were ever given. Go back to teaching school. <laughs> 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 it's very difficult to say the, what the best advice is because it's difficult to remember everything, but of more recent years, the best advice I think I had came from this great question of, with me is whether I am a soprano, a mezzo-soprano, or a contralto. And my husband said to me, look, you just cannot decide. You're a different kind of a singer than a lot of singers. You're going to have to make your own rules, and you'll have to choose the parts if they suit you, whatever they are. And that was really sort of a turning point in my, my whole thoughts about singing because at that point I was just tearing myself apart. Am I going to sing Amneris? Am I going to sing Mimi? You know, am I going to sing Azucena? Rodimus. Yeah. Rodimus, Zarastro. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, the best advice well, that I've right. received, but really important advice, to, is to try to discipline your life so that whatever you do, you're well prepared and... Uh, you have given yourself the proper time so that when you do get on the stage, you, it's f as close to a first-class performance, if not a first-class performance, as possible. That sounds like. And I guess advice. we've all oh, that's received. Oh, that's a marvelous advice, and one has yes. to live by it. But I think the actual advice, as far as a turning point, was was um, my husband telling me to to concentrate on the the um, bel canto repertoire and um, make. To, uh, take advantage of the coloratura ability that I seem to have. And that was certainly a turning point in my career. <laughs> it did make a bit of a difference. Didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a letter from Mary Page of this city. She wants your comment. It has been said, she's evidently quoting somebody else, it's been said that as long as there are tenors, there will always be prompted. That's most unfair to tenors. Yes, I, I think tenors have been very much, uh, too much maligned. <laughs> it seems like everybody gets on a panel discussion or, or on the Tonight Show or something, they talk now about tenors. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we all need the prompter occasionally. <laughs> yes, this is true, but I must say that there are times when it happened to me in this house in a recitative. It was one of those fast, dramatic recitatives, and I got lost, as usual. And I'm there trying to emote and get it all out, and I looked at the tenant of the prompter. <laughs> <laughs> I Sigmund looked Freud at the prompter like <laughs> desperately for a cue, and he looked at me and went, brava. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I you, did you finish the question? <laughs> Have you any feeling about prompters, oh, pretenders I, or otherwise? I'm very fond of a good prompter. I can assure you, I, I, I need him. Really, it, he, he, he helps very much. I think he's a very important person in, in the opera house, and helps very much to hold everything together. Really, 
with, with cues to chorus and, and so on. You know, I can so understand that very, very well. Essential. And yet for somebody who Especially knows... with cast changes all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or language changes. But for people like you who know your roles upside down and backwards and forwards... Yes, I'm but surprised. we have that moment when there's a lapse. It's, it, you it know, happens. And it's just heaven to look down and just before you're to sing the word, you hear it. Brava. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, though, that not too many conductors, for instance, would like to conduct the final ensemble from Falstaff without a prompter. No, you better yes. believe it. Yes. There, he's really worth his weight in gold. Mm -hmm. uh, well, evidently he is because he hold, does hold performances together, as we really know. Uh, it's usually impossible, I know, to choose a single favorite uh, anything, but this is a question from David Snell of Phoenix, Arizona, makes it a little bit easier for you. He wants to know... If you can give us an example of one phrase that you always enjoy singing, and then possibly one that often scares you a little bit. Or uh, aren't you ever scared? <laughs> Miss Sutherland? Well, one I enjoy singing is um, Alfredo Alfredo from the, the third act of Traviata. And I think as far as one I'm apprehensive about, I would say it's the first phrase of any opera I perform in because I just don't really know, in spite of warming up, what... Uh, just exactly what's coming out on, on any particular night. I, I would... Absolutely <laughs> I, would, I, I think we shouldn't <laughs> tell what we're afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think, quite right. I think that's... I got that's out of it nicely. Part of becoming a good singer is being able to disguise what you hold in terror. <laughs> well, isn't it comforting to know that if you say what you're afraid of in the next review you'll read, you could tell Miss Horn was afraid at that point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's right. Well, I, one of the phrases, in, again in Madame Butterfly, when um, Sharpless asks... Uh, the, the little baby, what's your name? And she says, um, today my name is Trouble, but tomorrow I'll be called Joya, Joya. I think that's one of the loveliest musical phrases. I think for me, and this is something that I have not sung in, on the opera stage yet, but I have done it in concert many times. I just adore singing O Ir der Eide from the immolation scene. Ah. That yeah. is really heaven. <laughs> it's a wonderful it's thing, I just my friend. This letter uh, is from Mrs. Teresa Nalieri of Avern, New York, and she writes, I've heard many attempts at trills, but very few real ones. And so I'm wondering, is a singer born with a trill? Can you acquire a trill by study and exercise? And she adds, I think it's the most thrilling sound in voice there is. I don't think you're born with it, do you, Joan? Yes, I do, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't I know. I think some are born with it and some acquire it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> yes, but let me ask as you. As you call sitting on the fence. Yes, but that's right. <laughs> but uh, since, since you and I trill together on occasion, <laughs> uh, didn't you f find at any point during your studying that you had to uh, analyze a trill at, at a certain that's point? That's perfectly true, Jackie. Um, um, but I, I can't remember when I didn't trill. I, I heard um, old records. This is, I think, how most of us came to be interested in opera at all, quite apart from our family backgrounds or the fact that our, we, our, our, our families did sing. Um, one listened to records, and um, as a very small child, I remember thinking, aha, they don't just sing a straight line. They actually do things, you know, with a given note. Mm -hmm. And... I thought, hmm, she's going backwards and forwards from one note to another, and I did. Right. Yes, but don't you think it's an exaggeration that you came in this afternoon and said, Hello! <laughs> <laughs> oh, Martina, I can't stop you. You really is too much. <laughs> Here's a quite different uh, question. It has something to do with interpretation, perhaps. It's from Hilda Fischel of Berkeley, California, who writes that the great baritone Dietrich Fischer Dieskau was asked whether he isn't, in effect, two different opera singers, one singer on stage and one on recordings. And his answer was that that is absolutely correct. He said, the role of Papageno in The Magic Flute, for example, is one that I shall never sing on stage because I think my appearance as Papageno would be ridiculous. But I love the role, and I'm delighted to have been able to sing it in two different recordings of the complete opera. So the question is, are there any roles that you would be happy to sing on a recording and uh, would not do on stage? 
Miss Arroyo? Well, I'd love to sing Salome on recording. As a matter of fact, I'd do it on stage if Jackie would do the dance. <laughs> If you provide me with 77 veils instead of... 99, 99. <laughs> uh, and I'd also like to sing Brunhild, um, not Brunhild, excuse me, uh, Isolde on, on recording. I'd love that one day. I'd love to hear it, Miss uh, Also, for obvious reasons, I would uh, love to sing Octavia or the Componist on recordings, but I just couldn't do it on stage, you know. You <laughs> could if you walk on and back off. <laughs> or a maxi coat. <laughs> I never thought of that. A Mexico. That's the. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Sutherland? Um, I would like to do Susanna, but uh, I think also for obvious reasons, perhaps I shouldn't do that either. <laughs> I remember one that I've heard you sing on recording, but never seen you in, because uh, that's the forest spirit in Siegfried. That oh, well, you never see me in that anyway, but I did do that on stage. I mean,. In, no, in did you do it in the opera house? Live performance. <laughs> On top of a ladder, yes. <laughs> uh, here's a one about conductors from John H. Orenberg of Brookline, Massachusetts. Talk when a conductor... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, we're on ticklish ground, aren't we? Uh, when a conductor commits various kinds of mayhem, such as, and there are three listed here, rushing the music so fast you can barely make it from one phrase to the next, or taking the music so slowly that you gasp for breath, or drowning you out with thunderous fortissimos, the question is, what can a singer do? And what do you do in a situation like that? They divorce them. Well, I, I think that, uh, um, you know, as, as my husband, for, for my money, that is, uh, accommodates me, Splendidly. I, I think I'd better leave the question to somebody else. <laughs> Martina? Well, your husband has accommodated me splendidly, too. <laughs> I think I'm probably the it's only one who should have talked to me. Oh, I, I give this question to Martina. <laughs> <laughs> well, my husband's a violist. <laughs> Uh, but I usually go to the conductor quietly and privately and humbly and uh, try to discuss it with him if it's that it's going too slowly. Ask him, would he accommodate me at this particular moment of my career? I can't take it at that particular speed. And then usually it's slower by the next performance. I have, <laughs> I have a wonderful story. Actually, I, this happened to me in San Francisco quite a few years ago. I was singing Mozetta. And I couldn't sing the first performance because it was back-to-back -back with Wozzeck. And uh, so I went to the performance, you know, to listen to it and everything. And as it turned out, the aria waltz was so fast that I knew I would choke to death on it. <laughs> so I went to my husband. I said, oh, I've got to figure out something to do psychologically. So we cooked up this thing. I went into the piano rehearsal with the conductor raced through the waltz like you've never heard it in your life. He said, no, no, signora, no, no. Too fast. He, too fast. He slowed it down perfectly. <laughs> it that works perfectly like also if you want a piano passage and everyone else is yelling a little bit and you know that it, you'd prefer it piano, so you sing so piano that no one can hear you. Oh, yes. You know, and then eventually someone will say, why aren't you singing? <laughs> and they say, well, it's said piano. <laughs> <laughs> and then they scale it down. Well, I can see you have all the psychological <laughs> approaches. The best thing, though, is really to say that you, you know, I, I'm terribly sorry. I, I'm not a very good singer. I just can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> just be honest. But, and usually, the funny thing is people think the conductor is un, uh, unreasonable. On the contrary, if you give a conductor a reasonable reason... I mean, and, and show that it works for you another way. That 99 out of 100 are reasonable. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a luck. <laughs> Here's a fan who really feels for suffering singers. Floyd W. Martin of Northfield, Minnesota, asks our star-spangled panel, what question does each of you get most tired of having to answer in public? I'm not Leontine Price. I'm Weary Grist. <laughs> uh, 
it's a glorious thing being compared to someone, especially someone so great. But I've been sitting in the audience on a performance where Miss uh, Price was singing, and a lady came up and said, may I have your autograph, Miss Price? And I said, <laughs> I'm not Miss Price. And she said, oh, yes, you are. <laughs> I said, no, madam, my name is Anderson. <laughs> I, I wish it were possible for us to go on now, but I'm afraid I've just had a signal that our time is up for today. So thank you very much, Martina Arroyo, Marilyn Horn, and Joan Sutherland for being with us and being so generous today. This is Edward Downs wishing you all a happy summer and inviting you to be with us on December 5th when Texaco inaugurates its 31st season of complete opera performances broadcast live from the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City. And a very heartfelt thanks for all the letters from the audience and a very long so long until December 5th.